Meet Moroku. With jet black hair and pale skin, someone could easily confuse her for a beautiful woman. Until they saw the long slit she has for a mouth, stretching all the way up to her ears. Otherwise known as the slit mouth woman, Moroku isn't entirely human. As an urban legend, she feeds off the fear of her victims and the strength of her rumors to survive. Considering how terrifying she looks, you would think everyone would run away screaming at the sight of her. Everyone except Sano Kyochi, a 17-year-old boy who was destined to be Moroku's husband. Moroku is always trying to scare him, just like this morning. She appears in all her horror with her mouth stretched out wide, but her betrothed calmly closes his book and grades her 2 out of 10. Moroku slumps in defeat, and Kyochi suggests she change up her routine. It's hard to be scared by the same old shtick, so he says she should try a little variation to satisfy her customers. By satisfy, he means scare, and by customer, he means victims. Moroku reminds him that he is not a customer, more like her fiancé. And how does a high schooler end up engaged to a creature of legend, you ask? In this universe, there are families who have taken up the task of keeping urban legends alive. One of them is the Sano household, who have the tradition of marrying the heads of their family to these mythical monsters. Moroku doesn't want to marry Kyochi, but she doesn't have a lot of choice. In her heyday, she was a cultural phenomenon, a legend spread and feared by all. She didn't need to rely on anyone else for her existence, and could use her own powers to increase her reputation and maintain her status. But nowadays, people don't believe in the slipmouth woman, and if the rumors continue to die out, then so will Moroku. So, she's been forced into a contract with the Sano family, and unless she can scare Kyochi just once before he turns 18, then they must be married. Until then, they will live together like a couple, and Moroku will continue to do her best to break the contract. When Kyochi asks why she's so against the marriage, it turns out Moroku had a lot of reasons. Firstly, she doesn't want to be married to some high schooler, and would much rather regain her powers through her own efforts. But she's also pretty sure that a marriage between a regular human and an urban legend can't end well. Moroku also thinks Kyochi was forced into the agreement, but his gentle treatment suggests otherwise. And if that didn't do it, then admitting that he hopes everything will go ahead as planned makes it pretty clear. I'm really not sure what's wrong with this kid for him to have fallen for a character from straight out of a horror film, but he openly admits that he likes her. And shouldn't anyone have the right to marry the person they like? Moroku kind of just assumes he's joking, but Kyochi doubles down and decides that in the year leading up to his birthday, he is determined to woo her and earn her love. It's one heck of a setup, but seeing as Kyochi can already make his fiancée tremble just by standing near her, we can already guess who's in the lead. But let's see who trips up first. Will Moroku lose her scare factor, or will the determined Kyochi lose in love? The next day, Moroku goes searching for the right atmosphere for her next scare, and discovers a shed with just the vibe she's looking for. Hoping that the perfect location will be what finally freaks out her fiancé, Moroku is distracted planning the ambush, when Kyochi himself creeps up behind her with a demon mask and scares her so badly that her jaw literally becomes unhinged. Kyochi overheard her plan and says she failed again pointing to the other masks hung around the shed. Kyochi explains that this space is dedicated to his collection of antiques and artworks, and jokes that maybe his hobby is the reason he isn't afraid when her jaw falls off. Moroku insists that she wasn't scared, and her jaw dropped was just a coincidence, but she still doesn't know how he stood there so casually when any sane person would have run for the hills. Kyochi tells her he loves her no matter how she looks, leaving his fiancé completely speechless. When she recovers her wits, Moroku begins to rant at her high school sweetheart. In the middle of her speech, she discovers that her supply of thread has nearly run out. She uses it to tie up her mouth, so that she can go out in public without attracting attention, which makes it pretty essential. When Kyochi asks, Moroku says she much prefers having the slit mouth, but given the problems it causes, she feels that she has to keep it sewn shut even if it's a hassle. She quickly gets irritated with all his questioning and confronts Kyochi, asking if he has an issue since he's complaining so much. Kyochi takes the opportunity to tell her that no matter if it's torn or sewn, he always thinks she looks beautiful, and immediately makes her blush again. Put another point on the board for Kyochi, looks like this teenager has some tricks up his sleeve. But Kyochi is also a little concerned. She's literally sewing her skin. Doesn't that hurt? Moroku says it isn't painful, so Kyochi asks if he can touch it. His fiancée agrees, since her body is totally different to humans and she won't be able to feel a thing. At least that's what she thinks. When Kyochi rests a hand on her cheek and puts his finger to her lips, she certainly seems to feel it. Her eyes open wide as spotlights, and she starts blushing again. Ding ding ding! Another point for Kyochi. This kid is racking them up. When she recovers from embarrassment, Moroku calls him a pervert, thinking that he tried to kiss her. Kyochi isn't a total jerk, so he apologizes, but explains that it was only his finger that touched her. When she realizes her overreaction, Moroku sort of slumps on the floor, too embarrassed to say goodbye when he gets up to leave. 
Well, that shed certainly did turn out to have a great atmosphere, just not maybe the one she was hoping for. Clearly, Kyochi's touch left quite the impression. When she goes to sleep that night, Moroku dreams about their interaction. But before it can get really steamy, she wakes up. In the aftermath of the dream, she is frustrated, unable to understand how Kyochi has had such an impact on her, why he says such suggestive things in real life as well as in her dreams. In her experience of humans, especially in the days when she was most feared, humans were always afraid of creatures like her. But the first time she met Kyochi, he just smiled at her. Deep in thought, Moroku hardly notices where she's going, until she stumbles into a little old lady, who appears from out of nowhere and scares her stiff. For such a terrifying monster, Moroku gets scared a lot more often than she does the scaring. This tiny old woman is their maid, Saya, who introduces herself and tells her Kyochi just went out. Moroku is surprised, because Kyochi hardly ever goes outside, especially so early in the morning. Instead of being suspicious, she takes this as another opportunity to catch him off guard while he's alone and not expecting her to follow. She runs off all excited, and finds her fiancé not far from the house. Moroku makes sure not to be seen, peering around a corner which gives her a great vantage point, when Kyochi runs into some strange guy with sunglasses and blonde hair. She worries that he might have bumped into a gangster, and starts imagining that maybe this guy tried to trick Kyochi into giving him money or something. The stranger refuses to let go of Kyochi, and she overhears her fiancé refusing something, saying he doesn't have any interest in going to that terrifying place, whatever that refers to. Now Moroku is really worried. This sounds like a kidnapping. Determined to save him from what could be a terrible fate, Moroku pulls out one side of her stitches, calling out to the blonde stranger. When she drops her famous tagline, Am I beautiful? The stranger starts shaking and runs away, screaming like a baby. Kyochi, as usual, isn't scared or even surprised to see her. Obviously, it's great to have saved him, but Moroku is also excited to have been able to actually scare someone after her statue of a fiancé. Once the guy has disappeared, she asks her fiancé how he got involved with a thug, immediately assuming that he got himself into trouble by running his mouth. Kyochi is quiet, and Moroku starts babbling to fill the silence, asking if he's finally impressed after seeing what she's capable of when she actually tries. Right, as if she wasn't trying back at their house. While she's blabbering on, Kyochi is thinking back to his childhood, when he was picked on at school by kids who were jealous of his family's wealth. On one particular occasion, he had been cornered by two mean kids. But guess who turned up just in time? It was Moroku, pulling her slit-mouthed stunt to scare away the mean bullies. She must not have realized who he was at the time, but Kyochi has never forgotten her face, and the way she turned up just now reminded him of their very first meeting. While he's having this super emotional flashback, Moroku tries to get his attention by shaking him back to the present. When he finally answers, Kyochi just says he was thinking about how much he likes her, which, as usual, gets Moroku all flustered again. Kyochi interrupts her rambling and thanks her for saving him, though she doesn't realize that he means both now and in the past. While walking back, Moroku asks why he left the house so early, and Kyochi holds up a bag with a sewing kit and more thread. But Moroku doesn't realize that he bought it for her, and Kyochi wonders if he should just return it, since he prefers her natural smile anyway. If you can really call it a smile, that is. Before they arrive home, they are stopped by the blonde stranger again. He corners them and tells Kyochi that he won't be getting away this time, even though I'm pretty sure it was actually him who ran off screaming before. The blonde guy peeks behind Kyochi to where Moroku is hiding. After getting over the initial shock of seeing her again, he apologizes for acting so rudely now that he knows she is Kyochi's fiance. Now, Moroku is completely lost. The guy who she pegged as a mobster introduces himself as Uda, Kyochi's assistant and bodyguard, who has been with him since he was a kid. He's enjoying messing with Kyochi, but suddenly pulls away when he remembers his boss is late for school, and not even in his uniform yet. Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten he was a high schooler. Uda tells him to get changed and get ready, but Kyochi says he doesn't want to go to school, which is why he called it that terrifying place earlier. This makes Moroku worried that he's being bullied, or doesn't have any friends, but Kyochi just sees it as a waste of time. He needs to be at school before 8, which means he needs to leave the house at 7, will only finish by the afternoon, and get home at 5 at the earliest, which, I mean, yeah buddy, that's sort of how that works. Although he explains what he really hates is losing out on time with Moroku, Uda won't hear it. While he's a student, his priority should be learning. Kyochi argues back, so Uda asks Moroku to convince the kid to go, but she's drawn her own conclusion that all humans must be afraid of time, which just misses the point entirely. Saya the maid appears and puts her foot down, reminding Kyochi that part of their deal in having Moroku come and live with them was that he would work on his studies in exchange. 
For some reason, this is what convinces him to go and get changed, leaving Uda to admit to Moroku that Kyochi has a lot of issues with his family. He didn't used to talk much, and never bothered to get to know his own parents. Seeing the way he is around Moroku, Uda says he's glad, and can tell how much he loves her. He asks her to take care of his boss and calls him a lovable rascal. Moroku asks why he wears his hair so low, and if she can look under it. But Uda says he can't show his face, since he's a really shy person and it's too soon for him to reveal it in front of her. Sounds kind of suspicious, and maybe Moroko thinks so too, because she reaches out to touch him. But Kyochi appears and grabs her hand, joking that Uda just looks like that because it's his character design. Whether it really is his character design or a plot point, I'm sure we'll find out later. Before leaving, Kyochi gives his fiancée a spool of thread, which he apparently stole from the sewing club. As Uda hurries him off to school, Moroku stops him and thanks him for the thread, telling him to take care. I guess she set the bar really low because Kyochi is so overjoyed that he cracks the biggest smile yet. With each passing day, Moroku becomes more determined to wriggle out of their contract, so she asks Uda what time Kyochi is most vulnerable and when he lowers his guard, since none of her ambushes have worked at all. Uda suggests that his master is weakest in the morning, so she sneaks into his bathroom while he's still asleep, determined to catch him when he's defenseless. You can see where this is going, right? She slams a hand on his bed puts on her most terrifying voice, and peels back his duvet while delivering her most famous line. When Kyochi wakes up and sees her bulging eyes above him, he hardly reacts. He just grabs her by the shoulder and pulls her closer. Before he can make this series R-rated, Moroku jerks away, furious that she failed again after realizing she forgot to untie her thread. Not that it would really make a difference, it doesn't seem like Kyochi can be beaten by anything at this point. Moroku might have tried again if Kyochi hadn't suddenly pulled her into bed, still half asleep and holding her close. She starts to wriggle, making a fuss as Kyochi tells her to keep quiet. Otherwise, Uda and Saya will come and find them in a rather compromising position. Obviously, he wants to snuggle with his fiance as long as possible, so when Moroku tells him to let her go, she finds him conveniently fallen asleep. She seems deeply uncomfortable, until she remembers what Uda said about him not having much family and being too quiet. When she looks at how relaxed he seems on the bed, she can't find the heart to wake him. So, she gives in, burrowing into his side and closing her eyes, surprised to find herself comfortable in his arms. When Kyochi wakes up, the roles are reversed. When he discovers her snoozing beside him, for once it's his turn to sweat and have his heart racing at 100 miles an hour. After sleeping in the same bed and living together for some time, Kyochi decides the next step is to get his fiancé to eat with him. So far, she has always said no. Maybe something to do with the fact that she is not a human and has no need for food. But Kyochi knows that she can eat, so he asks what her favorite food is. When Uda walks into the kitchen later, he finds a picture straight out of a crime scene, which looks more like Kyochi's attempt at hiding a body than cooking. Moroku said her favorite food was hard candy, and even though it's not exactly beginner-friendly food, Kyochi is determined to make it, no matter what dark demons he ends up summoning from the mess he's created in that pot. Since Uda normally cooks, he's not had much practice, and since he's going to be the one to clean up after him, Uda decides he has to step in. Kyochi has been literally smashing all his fruit, so Uda suggests that the strawberries are better thinly sliced. Then Kyochi, like an actual psychopath, starts trying to slice the fruit in his hand. Uda freaks out when he cuts his palm, and while he's getting a bandage, he asks his young master what all this mania is for. Kyochi tells him he wants to eat with Moroku, and Uda seems to understand his frustration. After all, there are a lot of things humans do that urban legends don't get involved with. Since they live together and she looks so human, it's easy for Kyochi to forget that Moroku and him are totally different beings. All he wanted to do was get closer to her by cooking, but now Kyochi just feels useless and a little stupid. Uda reassures him that all he needs is experience, and admits he thought all this was a part of a bigger plan to make her fall in love so that the marriage will go ahead, which, I mean, it kind of is in the grand scheme of things. But Kyochi just wants what's best for Moroku, and tells his bodyguard that it's really not that calculated. At the end of the day, he just wants the two of them to share a meal. Touched, Uda decides to save this disastrous attempt at cooking, and with his assistance, they end up with some pretty impressive looking candies that Moroku is absolutely obsessed with. It's been a long time since she ate anything at all, and definitely the first time she's tried this, so Kyochi asks if he can have one too, and picks one of her lollies. When he grabs it, Moroku sees the plaster on his hand from slicing the fruit, and when her fiancé starts talking about what he should make for her next, Moroku grows suspiciously quiet. Kyochi's candy must have worked on some level, because she clearly cares enough not to want him to get hurt, so Moroku tells him that next time, she'll be the one to make him something, only to return the favor, of course. Except, when it comes for her to cook, it turns out Moroku is nearly as awful as her husband-to-be. From where Uda watches at the sidelines, he's surprised to see just how alike they are for the first time. 
As this unlikely pair grows closer, it looks like Kyochi is winning their little battle. Now that he's going to school more regularly, Kyochi's classmates are taking more of an interest in him. One kid in particular has a hunch that Kyochi has a girlfriend, since he's always coming in late and seems happier these days. So this kid Kenchan decides to follow Kyochi to try to catch him with his girl because that's a totally normal thing for teenagers to do to their classmates. His two buddies couldn't care less, but Kenshan is kind of obsessed with Kyochi. It might come as a shock to hear, but apparently Moroku's moody fiance is the most popular guy at school. All these girls are obsessed with him. He even has his own fan club. As his friends point out, it would be far easier and way less creepy if the kid just asked Kyochi in person. But instead of being logical, the three boys stalk him into an alleyway, where they decide to split up after losing him around a corner. That's when Kyochi appears at Kenshan's shoulder and asks what exactly they're up to. I mean, they were hardly subtle. Kenshan just comes out with it and asks Kyochi if he's dating someone, which probably isn't what you're expecting to hear from three boys who are following you home. The boys start squabbling amongst themselves, so Kyochi excuses himself and turns to leave. Before he can get two steps, Moroku arrives right on time, and all the boys turn to stare at this gorgeous woman who just approaches Kyochi and tells him off for making her wait. Kyochi apologizes, but Kenshan ruins their tender moment by announcing that he was right. These two are definitely dating. I mean, he's not wrong, but was all the stalking worth it if he has to embarrass himself like this? Clearly, Kyochi's noisy classmate isn't done embarrassing himself just yet. He grabs Moroku's hands and asks what kind of relationship she has with him, insisting that they must be dating. Moroku gets pretty uncomfortable, as Kenshan asks question after question about their relationship and wants to know all sorts of weird details about Kyochi. Does, does this kid have a crush on him? He's still babbling away when Kyochi gently pushes her out of range and formally introduces her as Moroku Sano, answering all their questions by heavily implying that they're married. And then he just walks off, as if he didn't just basically tell a bunch of fellow high schoolers that he has a wife. Once they're out of earshot, Moroku gives him a pinch as punishment for lying about her name. Seeing them play fighting as they walk away, Kyochi's idiot classmates assume that she's just his sister. I guess you can't blame them, since they're all 17 and wouldn't expect a classmate to be married. Despite having jumped the gun and majorly embarrassed himself, Kenshan is so delighted that Kyochi remembered his name that he almost cries, finally admitting that it was him who made the fan club. Yep, this kid definitely has a crush. His buddies call Kenshan a stalker, teasing him, but as they're walking away, a strange dark presence emerges from the shadows of the alleyway, calling after Moroku and using Kyochi's surname. Looks like at least one person realized they weren't just siblings. One morning at the Sano home, Moroku is gazing at her reflection in a pond and wondering how she's failed to scare her husband so much. She's beginning to worry that she's lost her ability to strike terror into human hearts. While trying to figure out new techniques, Kyochi comes up behind her and spooks her so much that she ends up falling into the pond and dragging him with her. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if it's really Kyochi who's the demon. After getting soaked in pond water, Moroku settles down for a bath. Thinking out loud as usual, she grumbles that this is all Kyochi's fault, and hearing his name, her fiancé calls out from the screen door. Yelling at him to stop sneaking up on her, Moroku grumpily tells him that she won't be long in the bath, since he's just standing there, dripping wet while she has a good long soak. Kyochi tells her not to hurry as he doesn't want her to catch a cold. Obviously, a being like her can't catch a cold, or get sick at all. But even Moroku can admit that it's kind of sweet that he cares, and it is sort of her fault for pulling him in after her. She offers him anything he wants as a way of saying sorry. I have a feeling she's going to regret that. But Moroku is nothing if not proud, and she just says she doesn't want to owe him anything. The request he lands on is a date. Not like shopping or any of the other chores they get up to, just a normal, romantic date. He asks if there's anywhere in particular she wants to go, and Moroku says she'll think about it. Then she hears him sneeze from behind the screen door, and realizes she has been in the bath far too long. While she's getting out, Kyochi hears a loud noise from outside and comes rushing in, thinking she's slipped and hurt herself. Only when Kyochi steps inside, he finds her covered sitting on the floor, clutching at her face, which is missing a jaw. Searching manically for her jaw, Kyochi points out that it's sitting on her head, completely unfazed by the sight of his fiancé's gory, jawless face. How it got up on her head we may never know, but once she's managed to stitch it back on and Kyochi is out of the bath, Moroku insists she only slipped because she was hurrying after hearing him sneeze. Kyochi thanks her for worrying. Her concern is what he likes about her, as well as how clumsy she is. Really, it's a good thing she's his fiancé already, because this kid is already such a simp for her. As usual, Moroku acts like she didn't hear him and just turns away. Suddenly, a creepy noise sounds behind them, 
where the two lovebirds discover a demon of shadow, its hands creeping towards Moroku. As it envelops her, a voice warns that all secrets and bad intentions will come to the light. The shadow takes the form of a boy, who calls Kyochi a lowly insect and warns him to stay away from his elder sister. Whoa, didn't realize urban legends could have siblings. While Kyochi is too stunned to move, Moroku yells at her brother Makoto for making such a dramatic entrance. The legendary siblings haven't had a reunion in quite some time, and Makoto explains that since he last saw her, he is trained to become a respectable legend. But he's turned up at their door after discovering their engagement contract, and announces that he can't allow Moroku to marry into such a despicable family. Pretty harsh to talk about someone you only just met. I'm not sure how he's formed such a strong opinion of Kyochi already, but it seems like the feeling is mutual. Kyochi grabs his fiance protectively, and when Makoto tells him not to touch her, Kyochi reminds him that he's a stranger who just walked into their home. Makoto really doesn't handle hearing Kyochi call Moroku his wife, and the two of them start arguing with one another, grabbing Moroku so hard they almost tear her apart. When she yells at them, they back off, just as Uda arrives. Hovering by Moroku's side with a hand on her shoulder, Makoto launches into a rage and wraps his arms around his sister, deliberately trying to anger Kyochi even further. And what do you know? It works. Moroku, totally oblivious to her brother's tactics, tries to calm the situation by formally introducing him as the legend of the walking corpse with devilish ears. Turns out, it's sort of his thing to hear lies and hold people accountable for their deceit. Whatever that means. As Kyochi so brashly puts it, he's essentially a zombie with really good hearing. Uda and Kyochi have never heard of him, but that doesn't bother the kid, who swallows his pride to thank them for taking care of his sister. But that's about as far as his manners extend, because then he insists that the engagement between Kyochi and his sister be called off. But aside from their impending marriage, he's mainly just annoyed that Kyochi has taken the younger brother role away from him. Kinda weird that he thinks her future husband is acting more like a brother than a lover, but there are a lot of things that are kinda weird about this kid. Even Moroku accepts that he's always been a little strange. Kyochi asks how long the two of them have been related, since he's never heard of Makoto before. Her brother just says that's none of his concern. All he needs to know is that he's the most important man in her life. Again, I mean, is, is that true? I feel like a husband is a lot more important than a baby brother. Before long, Kyochi and Makoto are back to yelling at each other, and while they settle into their bickering, Uda offers to make some tea for himself and Moroku. Interrupting their fighting, Moroku pauses to ask her brother if there's anything wrong, since he seems more tense than she remembers. That's when Makoto asks her to come back with him to the House of Legends. He says the Sano family can't be trusted, that they're nothing but liars, and it's best to cut ties with them. Given that he just met the guy two minutes ago, it doesn't really seem like a fair assessment. But then again, he is the legend of deceit. If anyone knows about liars, it's him. While they were separated, Makoto has heard an old tale whispered between other legends, that humans from the Sano household trick their kind, using the contracts they forged to take advantage of them. Apparently, all the legends that have married into their family were used for their own gain. Some even suffered so badly that they chose to perish instead of staying with them. It seems like Moroku might have heard this rumor before. She insists that it's an old tale, and that the modern Sanos aren't like that. Surprised at her resistance, her brother asks if she's already fallen for her fiancé. When Moroku denies it, Makoto says that the Sanos can't have changed that much because Kyochi himself is lying to her. He asks her to think back on any conversations they've had that seemed dishonest, or might have even made her suspicious. Makoto is convinced her fiancé is nothing but a liar and is only going to use her. And while he's been flinging these accusations at the Sano family, Kyochi has been standing by silently, not denying a single word. So Moroku asks him if it's true, but he just turns to leave the room pausing by the door to tell her that he's sorry. Well, if that isn't suspicious, then I don't know what is. Makoto yells at him on his way out, calling him some very rude names and seeing this as proof of the Sano's deception. The idea that Kyochi might have been lying every time he said he liked her or called her pretty makes Moroku way more upset than expected. There's a sudden loud noise from outside, and the next second, Uda walks in and apologizes for the disruption. It seems Kyochi fell unconscious and has taken on a fever. Now how on earth did he manage to fall ill in the minute since he left the room? Uda reveals that Kyochi has been sickly ever since he was a kid. He tried to hide it while Moroku was around, but her brother's accusations must have pushed him over the edge. Standing at his bedside, Moroku wonders if he's been sick all this time, trying to hide his health with his weird gestures and sudden confessions. Aside from the trust issues, she still cares about him enough to sit by his bedside and take his health into her own hands. When Kyochi stirs, Uda leaves to give them a little privacy. Once he's come around, Kyochi seems embarrassed that his future wife saw what he thinks of as his pathetic side. Obviously, it's not pathetic to Moroku, who is just worried about his health. 
He asks after her brother, who has agreed to leave until Kyochi is better. Well, at least he's not a total douche. Kyochi apologizes, since his condition means they probably can't go on their date tomorrow. But he's also sorry for everything else that happened, and admits that the rumors her boyfriend heard about the Sano family were almost totally true. They pretend to be normal, but Kyochi knows about the legends they have tricked and used. While he can't run away from his family's past, he does really like her. About that, he's never lied. He reassures Amoroku's doubts, telling her that the Sano she would be marrying into are very different from the previous generations. They would never purposefully trick a legend nowadays. But if things are all peachy and he's not hiding some big secret, Moroku asks why he stormed out saying sorry. Realizing how it looked, Kyochi feels pretty stupid. His dramatic attitude definitely made the situation look a lot more serious than it was. Poor Moroku thought she was in a sham marriage. Kyochi admits that there was one lie he told, but it was only what he said about not even thinking about touching her before marriage. Uh-oh. Where's this going? It seems to have only just occurred to Kyochi that he's living under the same roof as the woman he loves, and with that realization came a lot of… desires. So if her brother picked up on him lying, it was probably just the struggle of resisting the… <clears throat> urges that have begun to surface. It seems the saintly Kyochi has finally been bested by his teenage hormones. It was only a matter of time, really. Moroku freaks out again, but when he draws close enough to kiss her, she lets it happen. And maybe they would have finally had their first kiss if he hadn't suddenly collapsed on her shoulder. I mean, the kid does have a fever, but talk about ruining the moment. It doesn't take long for Kyochi to recover, and once he's back on his feet, he's back with a vengeance, and so is Makoto. For some reason, the boys decide the best way to channel their anger is to have a badminton championship. You know, the way real men do. With Uda as the judge, and Saya watching on like the sweet old lady she is, the boys square up to battle for Moroku's favor. It was Makoto who suggested they duel, deciding that whoever wins will get to keep his sister. Kind of primitive to assume Moroku will just follow whoever wins a silly game of badminton, but go off I guess. Kyoji might have thought so too, but Makoto offered such high stakes that he couldn't say no. If Makoto wins, the engagement will be called off immediately, but if Kyochi wins, he can ask for anything he wants. Even Makoto's death if he asks for it. Delighted at the power a win would give him, Kyochi says he'll decide his price later, which leads them to the start of the match. The rules are pretty simple. Whoever misses the ball loses a point, and whoever ends up with the highest score will be the winner. But in the first round, neither of them dropped the ball once in 30 whole minutes. Uda even asks if they practiced in advance. For the second match, they enforce a time limit. It must be pretty dull to sit there and watch them battling back and forth all day. Sitting on the sidelines, Saya asks Moroku if she's rooting for Kyochi or her brother. Moroku answers that of course she's rooting for Makoto, since she wants the engagement to fall apart just as badly as he does. And besides, she doesn't want to be separated from her family again. She's saying all of this pretty loud, so loud that it catches Kyochi's attention and makes him miss a shot and drop the ball. So now, Kyochi is down one point, and for some reason, that means Moroku needs to paint something on her fiancé's face as punishment. So she decides to make them matching, painting little X's on his cheeks, just like the threat on hers. She presents him to the others as the slip-mouthed boy, enjoying the chance to tease him while her brother watches on, silently fuming. The battle is quite intense when it resumes, but due to their added time constraints, it ends up in a tie before the final round, which will decide the victor. Instead of stepping up his game for the final match, Makoto seems defeated, and says that he feels he's lost this battle already. He admits that he had thought Kyochi couldn't make his sister happy, or at least that's what he told himself, but seeing her laugh and smile with him during the match, he realized he was wrong. Then, he kinda throws a tantrum and acts all dramatic, inviting Kyochi to do whatever he wants as promised. But Kyochi had also been watching Moroku during the last few hours, and seeing her interact with her brother has made a very strong impression on him too. So, Kyochi decides that his only wish is that the next time Makoto visits, he uses the front door. That's it! Makoto asks if he's sure, reminding him that he won't stop getting in his way and trying to put a stop to their marriage. Kyochi shrugs and tells him that's fine. He doesn't care how hard he tries, he's just going to make Makoto accept him as a brother-in-law. Marriage does have to be approved by a family after all, he says he wouldn't want things any other way. Surprised and a little embarrassed about his childishness, Makoto apologizes for all the trouble he's caused and agrees to leave. But not before he gives his sister a peck on the cheek, and runs off before Kyochi can punch his lights out. Something tells me that won't be the last time that we see that kid. Kyochi is thinking the same, but despite her brother's disappearance, Moroku is surprisingly happy. Maybe all she really wanted was for the two of them to work things out so that she could have them both around. And she doesn't need to worry about being separated from her family. 
Makoto reappears far sooner than any of them would have expected, when he arrives in Kyochi's class as a transfer student. There's sure to be more trouble ahead with those two, but more importantly, who does Moroku really want to side with? Will this marriage end up falling apart, or is she already falling for Kyochi more than she realizes? Makoto, reunited with his sister for the first time in years, is surprised to find no trace of the horrifying legend she once was. Nowadays, she's more like a human woman, whose fiancé can get her blushing just by telling her she's pretty. Oh, how times have changed. But Moroko isn't flattered by the compliment. In fact, she takes it as an insult, a sign that she's lost her scare factor and isn't good for anything except her looks. So far, in the competitions between him and Kyochi, Kyochi has won every single one of them. But Moroku's brother has been watching his sister lose confidence in herself and her legend, so he is determined to keep fighting for her sake. He yells at Kyochi, telling him off for not being scared of Moroku, even though he admits that her attempts to frighten him are pretty dull. Yikes. Backhanded much, Mikoto? Moroko is clearly in need of a little advice, so Uda suggests she switch things up. To frighten someone like Kyochi isn't as simple as a jump scare or catching him off guard. Uda says she should try something especially tailored to him. Moroku likes the idea, so she asks Kyochi what he's afraid of. Her fiancé doesn't answer, but asks Moroku the same question instead. Reluctantly, she admits that she's scared of dogs, and now that she thinks about it, Kyochi looks like a little dog to her. Apparently, the resemblance is so strong that when he barks at her, it actually does get a reaction out of Moroku. While the two of them are play fighting, Uda asks if Makoto is planning on giving up, and of course he says he's not. He has faith that she will find a way to scare Kyochi and get her freedom and status back, one way or another. Eventually, the time comes for the lovebirds to go on their first date. Moroku is pretty nervous, so she calls up a very famous friend named Mary to ask for fashion advice. But Mary isn't very cooperative. She reminds Moroku that she used to be the queen of all urban legends. Someone like her shouldn't be worrying about what humans wear on dates. Even though it sounds like an insult, Moroku takes it as encouragement, and decides to stay true to herself by dressing the same as always. Well, I guess that's one way to spin it. But now Moroku is wondering what Kyochi will wear. Considering he's literally worn the exact same black turtleneck ever since she met him, I'd say it's a pretty safe bet to assume he won't put on anything too special. But just in case, Moroku goes to his room to get a sense of his style. And what does she find when she opens his wardrobe? An entire rack of identical black turtlenecks, just as expected. Any normal person would have walked straight out. But as Kyochi returns from school, he finds his fiance stuck inside one of his sweaters. Yelling from the inside, Moroku admits that she was worried Kyochi was thinner than her, since she's been eating so much candy lately. Can urban legends even gain weight? Like, is that a thing? Anyway, this would be a great time for Kyochi to reassure his wife-to-be that she's perfect just the way she is. But he's so entertained at the sight of her stuck inside his sweater that for a while, he just laughs. He says he likes it when she does stuff like this. It's kind of cute. Cute enough to bring him closer, hovering over Moroku as he leans in. But since it's Kyochi, he bottles it and settles for a kiss on the forehead. Which is hardly a surprise. I think it's pretty safe to say these two won't reach first base for quite some time. But the next day on the date, Moroku is so embarrassed by the kiss that she can't even look at him. Because of her reaction, Kyochi is also nervous, and now he's worrying that she hates him. Ah, this is gonna be awkward. Luckily, the theme park proves to be a good distraction. Moroku has never been on a roller coaster before, and it turns out she really likes them. But it's the haunted house that really captures her attention. When they discover a load of traumatized visitors emerging from the attraction, Moroku is obviously pretty keen to go inside. The haunted house is more like a standing cinema, and once they're in, it's easy to be distracted, especially by this one girl wearing bunny ears, who is trying to take pictures of the screen. Moroku feels more confident in this kind of atmosphere, so she walks up to the annoying girl with half her mouth unstitched and asks her to stop distracting the other visitors. Clearly, Moroku hasn't lost all her power just yet, because the girl is so terrified she drops her phone and obeys, probably scarred for life. Well, at least now we know if the whole urban legend thing doesn't work out, Moroku would make a great movie theater attendant. A few minutes later, the other visitors are rushing out crying and screaming, while Kyochi and Moroku are hardly even shaken. Once the awkwardness has worn off, time flies by, and before long, it's lunch. The suggestion of candy and sweets gets Moroku immediately excited, so Kyochi wanders off to get some. While she's waiting, Moroku spots Kenshan, the kid from Kyochi's class who is totally obsessed with him. His usual pals, Saruta and Kijiyama, are there too, chatting with Kyochi in the queue. Kenshan offers Moroku a very flustered apology for the other day, when he was practically interrogating her about her relationship. Moroku tells him he doesn't need to worry, and asks him to come and sit down beside her, since he's been yelling all of this from a distance like a total psycho. Honestly, this kid just gets weirder and weirder every time we see him. Kenshad reveals that he met her brother Makoto at school, who finally set the kid straight about the relationship between Moroko and Kyochi. But if the two of them are going out, Kenshan asks how come he said her last name was Sano when they first met. Moroko reluctantly admits that they're engaged, just in time for the others to show up behind them. 
Kyochi is touched to hear her finally admit the truth, since she's never really acknowledged their engagement out loud before. A very flustered Moroku tries to take back what she said, but Kyochi grabs her hand and places a gentle kiss on her palm, which shuts her up pretty immediately. And in the background of this very private moment, the three boys are holding their food and just kind of watching. At least Kenshan's friends have the good sense to drag him away before he can do any more damage, leaving the two lovebirds to eat in peace. Kyochi passes Moroku an entire bag of candy and donuts, but she's even more excited when Kyochi pulls out a lollipop, making a big deal about how it was the last one in the store and he got it just for her. He's really laying it on thick, telling her it was all worth it because he got to see Moroku finally admitting her engagement in public. Embarrassed, Moroku is forced to admit she had fun, and thanks him for the day through a mouthful of food. After the success of their first date, Moroku decides it's finally time to pay a visit to her other legend friends. And where do three urban legends meet to hang out, you ask? Pretty much exactly where you'd expect, in the middle of an abandoned lakeside near some old railway tracks, surrounded by shadows and ruin. The friends she's meeting are Viola, a busty white-haired woman who is very keen to hear about some of the saucier details of the date, and Mary, a little doll known as the girl on the phone, who is much more serious about the whole affair. Muriko puts them straight, admitting nothing much happened other than strolling around and sharing food. But Mary sees right through her, telling her she ought to be more honest about her feelings. After all, by this point they've been living together, dating, and even slept in the same bed. You don't do all that with someone you're not interested in. Viola agrees, and tells Muriko she should just give in to the marriage already. When Moroku resists, Viola comes out of nowhere and asks if it would be okay if she married Kyochi instead in that case. Moroku seems a little stunned, and Mary tells her not to joke around. Viola is kidding, of course, but she's proved her point. Moroku clearly isn't comfortable with the idea of letting someone else marry Kyochi, so she must have feelings for him on some level. As an apology for her mean joke, Viola offers to teach Moroku how to really scare Kyochi without relying on her slit mouth gag. So when she returns from her visit, Moroku puts what Viola taught her into practice and grabs Kyochi from behind, whispering in his ear. I guess Viola just wanted to play another trick on Moroku, because the stunt does not end up being anywhere near as terrifying as she expected. If anything, it's just kind of awkward. And when Moroku realizes it hasn't worked, she storms off, yelling at her fiancé to hide her embarrassment. But after she's walked away, Kyochi is stuck standing there, rubbing the spot she whispered against him and sweating like crazy through the rest of the day. It seems Viola's scare tactic might have had more of an impression than Moroku realized. The next day, Moroku is trying to return the favor Kyochi gave by cooking for her. She has enlisted the help of Uda in order to make rice dongos. So far, she's doing much better than her betrothed, although that isn't saying much. The last time Kyochi was in the kitchen, he made a mess that looked like something straight out of a horror film. Even though Uda has basically cooked both of their presents himself, he thinks it's sweet that she's trying to return the favor. But when he asks if this means she's given up on scaring him, Moroku insists that it's more like a break. Besides, Kyochi has exams coming up. She doesn't want to freak him out while he's working on his studies. Not that she's been particularly good at freaking him out any of the other times she's tried. When they finished cooking, Moroku thanks Uda for all his help, telling him he's an excellent housekeeper. Uda thanks her for the compliment, but reminds Moroku that he's no housekeeper. He originally came to the Sano household as a bodyguard for Kyochi, but after he fell ill, he started taking on more and more household tasks for the sake of his young master's health. He wasn't very good at first. Uda says it was his wife who taught him how to cook. Seriously, what's with all the married teenagers in this series? Uda doesn't look a day over 16, but apparently he has a wife? Moroku is just as surprised. When Uda shows her his ring, she's so shocked that she runs screaming into Kyochi's room, asking if he knew the bodyguard was married. Of course Kyochi knew, but he won't answer any of her questions about this mysterious wife, telling Moroku she should ask Uda herself. He catches sight of the dongos in her hand, so Moroku explains that she made them for him, as a study snack. Although, it looks like Kyochi has abandoned his studies in favor of cleaning. While he's sorting through the books on his shelf, Moroku spies a few pieces of dust at the back of his head and starts picking them out, enjoying the feeling of his hair between her fingers. When she realizes what she's done, she steps back and apologizes, quickly wandering off to get tea for their dongos. She doesn't notice, but when she walks away, her fiancé is a mess behind her, deeply flustered by the feelings of her hands in his hair. All aboard the simp train, party of one. As a result of Moroku's unintentional flirting, Kyochi has a strange dream the next morning. A giant fish head Pisces stands between two Morokus, one with her mouth sewn and the other with it open. In the dream, the fish head asks Kyochi which one has fallen for him, and he says both. But then one grabs him from behind, and the other one advances towards him, leaning so close his head starts to pound. He wakes up just before the kiss, at the same time as Saya, the housemaid, arrives to wake him. 
a little shaken by the dream, he stops by Moroko's room before school and overhears her talking to herself. She seems to be regaining control over her powers, and for the first time in a while, she can open and seal up her slit mouth without using the thread she usually uses. She can't keep it up for long, but Moroku seems delighted, and even says out loud that she can't let Kyochi find out about this. Too bad he's standing in the doorway. During his tests at school that day, Kyochi can hardly concentrate, as his head is so wrapped up in thoughts about Moroku. Without realizing it, she's making him fall more and more in love with her, and he's beginning to wonder if it's on purpose. He's so distracted that he doesn't even notice the bell going at the end of the test, or Makoto walking up to him. Seeing that he is clearly distracted, Makoto asks if something's up. Kyochi says he used to be able to read Moroku like a book, but now he has no idea what she's thinking and doesn't know how to act. Makoto clearly doesn't understand the nuances of these kinds of relationships, because the only thing he can think to do is call his sister. Before Kyochi can protest, the phone is already ringing, and then she picks up. The clumsy girl tells Kyochi she's fallen into the pond again, which makes him laugh so hard that he relaxes again. He tells her he likes her, and even though it's not the first time he said it, Moroku gets all embarrassed like she normally does, which makes Kyochi feel even more at ease. Feeling renewed by their call, Kyochi takes off. Makoto starts to follow, but guess who's waiting right outside the classroom? It's the Kyochi fan club, Kenshan, Saruta, and Kijiyama. They ask Makoto what he was talking to Kyochi about, and if the two of them are close. Makoto doesn't really answer, but he does somehow let slip that they've played a lot of games together, like badminton and Go. He leaves out the fact that they are all in vicious competition for his sister's marriage, but the boys are so jealous they don't even question it. They invite him to play games with them sometime and wander off, leaving Makoto to pick up his stuff from his locker. Alone in the hallway, he suddenly gets suspicious when Kyochi returns, claiming he wants to walk home together. Now, I don't know if you've been watching, but Makoto and Kyochi aren't exactly buddies, so Makoto knows instantly that this apparition is not Kyochi. He asks the pretender what they're doing, and the fake Kyochi responds that he could ask the same thing. It was this person who gave him the truth about the Sano family's reputation, but Makoto is still hanging around, and even spending time with Kyochi. With that uniform on, the fake Kyochi jokes that Makoto looks more like a human than a legend, and suddenly lunges at him with a knife. The next day in school, Kyochi's class is gearing up for their last test of the semester, but one desk is mysteriously empty. But Kyochi doesn't have to wonder why Makoto is absent for long. He gets a call from an unknown number, and when he picks up, it's Makoto, calling from Mary's phone. He warns Kyochi that he needs to get home straight away. Moroku is in danger. Back at home, the slip-mouthed woman herself seems to have discovered the doppelganger lurking by the front gate. Of course, Moroku doesn't know there's someone parading around in her fiancé's skin, but she has reason to be suspicious, given that he's not wearing his school uniform. Luckily, Moroku can take a hint or two. She walks right up to the gate and slaps this stranger right across the face. The spot she slapped him seems to be stinging the doppelganger, and reveals one glowing sharp eye for just a moment before the mask returns to Kyochi's face. But this stranger claims he doesn't want to hurt Moroku. Instead, he wants to get out of the contractual marriage, so he decides to tell her the truth about the Sanos, the whole truth this time. Only two generations ago, the head of the Sano family seduced many legends into marriage. Every legend that tried to rebel against their contracts was locked up, and some never made it out. The doppelganger swears that Kyochi is the same. He has their blood, so he's no different to his forefathers. But instead of being swayed, Moroku blows him off, telling the doppelganger that he talks too much, and she knows Kyochi better than him. This makes the pretender so angry that he lunges at her with a knife. Inches before it pierces Moroku, something comes swinging at the fake Kyochi's head, and he drops his weapon on the ground. Kyochi himself has arrived, like a knight in shining armor, and not a moment too late. Kyochi tells the faker to get lost, and then he just… does. Moroku seems concerned that they let the doppelganger get away, but Kyochi doesn't care. He's just relieved that his fiancé is unharmed. Moroku can tell he was really worried, so she reassures Kyochi that she's fine, she wasn't harmed, and everything's okay. Meanwhile, Saya the pervy maid just sort of watches from behind the gate. Nice one, Grandma. Way to make everyone uncomfortable. Once they're all safely inside, Saya admits that what the doppelganger told her is only half the story. There's a much longer tale to be told. But what they don't know is that the doppelganger legend has returned, and this time he's managed to open the gate. Pretty pleased with himself, the legend doesn't notice Uda appearing behind him, and when he turns, he catches a glimpse of Uda's eyes and recognizes him as far more than just a bodyguard. That's when it's revealed that Uda himself is a legend who went by the name of Karashibe, or the Black Serpent a creature who could turn his victims to stone with just one glance. Looks like Kyochi and Moroku might be dealing with more than they bargained for, both with the doppelganger and the secret legend lurking in their midst. While Uda revealed his true colors as a legend who can turn people to stone, Kyochi and his fiancée were listening to Saya, the housemaid, reveal her own story with the Sano family, totally oblivious to the danger lurking outside. 
Sometime in the 20th century, the Sanos were right at the height of their power, marrying and using as many legends as they could get their hands on, that is, until the brides-to-be started going missing. There was a rumor among the maids that a legend known as the Black Serpent was responsible, since he had a well-known grudge against the Sanos and was living with them at the time. The Black Serpent, also known as Kirishibe, had a soft spot for the daughter of his master, the clan leader. Though not related to the Sanos by blood, the girl was taken in by them. She was the only one who treated the Black Serpent with any kindness. There was also the young master Kutaru, nephew to the clan leader. Unlike his uncle, however, Kutaru wasn't on good terms with the Serpent and always hung around him and the young lady. Kutaru, like any person with eyes, could tell the Black Serpent had feelings for the adopted daughter. He encouraged his friend to be honest and express his love to her, but the Serpent never allowed himself to get involved, because of his complicated relationship with the Sanos. You see, as the next head of the family Kataru was originally meant to be engaged to the Black Serpent, that is, before they met him and realized that he was, in fact, a dude. Although they called off the engagement, the Black Serpent remained in the household as a guest of the family. Well, a kind of guest. In exchange for being freed from his contract, he was forced to do the clan leader's bidding, including turning his future brides to stone when they no longer obeyed him. The serpent had no desire to harm other legends, but he knew that if he disobeyed or spoke out, it would put the young lady in danger. So in exchange for the young love's safety, he turned them all to stone, using the serpents on his neck. Kotaru wasn't like the rest of his family, and pitied the serpent. Knowing how much it pained him to be tied to such a monstrous family, he came up with a plan to help his friend escape. Once their plan was set in motion, the Black Serpent had a decision to make. He had struggled to deny his feelings for the young lady, convincing himself that a legend and a human could never be together. But when the day finally came, he couldn't hold back any longer, and asked his love if she would be willing to die with him. Now, I'm not exactly sure how flirting works in the legend world, but I don't think that line would have worked on me. While the Black Serpent and the young lady were making their twisted promises, Kataru was enacting the final phase of his master plan. Leading his uncle into the shed where they kept all the petrified legends, the clan leader was shocked to find them all alive and breathing once again. When he asked how such a thing was possible, Kataru presented the snakes from the Black Serpent's back, cut off and laid in a box, to convince him that the serpent had killed himself and thereby freed all the legends he had turned to stone. Obviously, being frozen and abused for so many years left all those legends with one heck of a grudge. As they gathered around his uncle to take their revenge, Kataru promised to clear the Sano name and rebuild their family from the ground up. Surprisingly, his uncle wasn't angry that his nephew had literally conspired to murder him. In fact, he only wished him good luck, and allowed himself to be consumed by the legends he had imprisoned for so long. Meanwhile, the Black Serpent and his love were in fact not dead, and running away from the Sano household. You see, what the Serpent neglected to mention in all his years of service was that he could turn back those he had petrified at any time he liked. So when Kataru offered to help him escape, they faked both their deaths and cut off his snakes to convince his uncle, leaving Kataru behind and allowing them to vanish without a trace. When the Black Serpent tried to explain all this to the young lady, she burst into tears, as anyone probably would if they had just been stolen away from their home and asked to fake their death. The Serpent felt terrible, wishing that he could stop time so that they could be together this way forever. The young lady told him firmly that she didn't want time to stop. She wanted to see every season pass by, but only with him. Overwhelmed, the serpent embraced her and finally confessed his love. His young lady said she loved him too, and promised to never let go of his hand as she grew old at his side. And it turns out, that's exactly what happened. When we return to the present, it's revealed that the Black Serpent was none other than our old friend Uda, and his wife Saya, who looks just as beautiful as ever. Who saw that one coming? Not Moroku, clearly. After hearing the story, the slit-mouthed woman is so embarrassed that she tries to hide in a giant pot. She didn't even know that Uda was a legend, not to mention that he was married to their housemaid. Of course, Kyochi knew all along. In another flashback, it's revealed that in his old age, Kataru asked Uda to look after his grandson Kyochi once he was gone. While he was alive, Kataru dedicated himself to clearing the Sano family name. And maybe the reputation would have been restored if it wasn't for this doppelganger, who has been spreading rumors and parading around as Kyochi. And if you're wondering what their enemy was up to during all these flashbacks, don't worry. Turns out Uda petrified him in seconds and left him frozen all night long. While the others are trying to figure out what to do with him, Makoto comes flying in. Well, his head does. Apparently, when this doppelganger cornered him at school, it took apart all of Makoto's stitches from head to toe, so the poor kid has spent all this time trying to put his body back together to rush over in time. But his head hit the petrified legend so hard that it cracked the stone, and turned him back to his real self, which is a child? 
Makoto, who is still just hanging out as a head, explains that this kid used to be his friend, until he pointed a knife at his sister and threatened her life, obviously. The doppelganger was also the one who spread the rumors about the Sano family. It turns out he did all of this because he was actually really worried that the Sanos would take Makoto away and hurt his sister. Makoto asks Kyochi if he can take the kid back to the realm of the legends for his punishment, and his brother-in-law agrees. But before he lets them go, Kyochi gets up real close and warns the boy never to step foot in his house or come near Moroku ever again. Which is kind of valid, honestly. Even if he is a kid, he's still threatened to kill his fiance. In the realm of legends, a council has gathered to decide the kid's punishment, formed of Violet, Makoto, Uda, and Mary. But the decision they come to is pretty light. They decide the doppelganger should become Mary's apprentice. It will involve changing his original nature and powers, but it does basically guarantee that he'll become her heir. It kind of sounds more like a reward than a punishment to me, but the kid sure doesn't see it that way. But he doesn't have much of a choice, so the kid reluctantly agrees, formally introducing himself as Satoru, while Mary agrees to take him on. When he returns to the human realm, Makoto recounts the events to Kyochi, and asks him if it will actually be possible for a legend to change their own story. Kyochi agrees that it could happen if someone really wanted Wanted it to. All legends change over time. Even Moroku used to be more gruesome and extreme than she is now, though it's hard for Kyochi to imagine when he comes home and finds his fiance has accidentally cut herself an adorable bob. It doesn't really matter, since the hair will grow back by the morning, but Moroku hasn't touched a pair of scissors since the days when it was part of her original myth. She asks whether Kyochi prefers her hair long or short, and, ever the player, he takes the opportunity to get up close and promise her he'll always love her hair, whatever it looks like. This guy never misses a beat, but he does admit that he kind of prefers it long, because he says she looks way too much like her brother right now, which is understandably disturbing. But Moroku is a little disappointed. She was kind of expecting him to have a more dramatic reason, like some bad experience with a short-haired girl that would make him hate Bobs. Well, once again Moroku has proven herself as the best foreshadowing tool in the series. While the Kyochi fan club are patrolling the halls at school, they bump into exactly the girl Moroku is imagining a short-haired senpai who asks the three boys to deliver a letter with a big heart to Kyochi. I smell trouble. Somehow, the letter works its way into Moroku's hands, because of course it does. She knows her teenage fiancé is pretty popular, so she's not surprised he's received some interest. But when she walks in on Kyochi on the phone with someone named Mao, agreeing to meet up, Moroku starts to panic. Suddenly remembering the name on the corner of the love note, Mayori, Moroku worries that he's cheating on her. So, like any normal person, she puts on a ridiculous disguise and follows him. She's half hoping that the Mao from the phone and the Mao from the letter might be different people, or even just a guy friend. But when this adorable short-haired high schooler appears, her suspicions are confirmed. From the way she's talking, it seems like Kyochi and her are pretty close, especially the way she's holding his arm and dragging him around lots of different shops. If this isn't the definition of a date, I don't know what is. But disaster strikes when Mao turns a corner and catches Moroku, spilling her drink all over her. She immediately recognizes her as the slit-mouthed woman, even with the mask on, because she says Kyochi has talked about her so much she would know her anywhere. And that's when Mao formally introduces herself as Manomike, Kyochi's cousin. Whew! Crisis averted, people. Moroku is super confused, so she holds up the confession letter and asks Mao if it belongs to her. It turns out it does, but it was actually meant for her, not Kyochi. Moroku looks like she's about to have a stroke, so Kyochi shows up to clear the confusion. It turns out Mao is getting married, and the letter is actually an invitation to the ceremony. She was only with Kyochi so he could help her pick out a gift for her husband. Moroku is touched to have been invited, and excited to get to know Mao better after she runs off. Kyochi is pretty amused by the misunderstanding, not to mention the disguise which covers basically nothing except his fiancé's mouth. As usual, Kyochi knew what she was up to from the start. He just kind of enjoyed teasing her. Annoyed, Moroku warns him that in the future, he should always tell her if she's planning on meeting up with a girl, telling her high school sweetheart he is only allowed to like her. Well, I guess we now know that Moroku is the jealous type, and Kyochi likes it. So much so that he goes in for a kiss. Over the face mask? It definitely comes off a lot less romantic than he pictured in his head, because when Kyochi pulls away, his face is bright red. It's okay, buddy. You can't win them all. The day of Mao's wedding finally rolls around, and when they arrive, Moroku immediately bursts into tears. Mao comes running up to them, and Moroku tells her straight away how gorgeous she looks, thanking her for the invite and wishing her a happy married life. Man, for someone who loves weddings so much, you'd think she'd be more eager to have her own. Mao hands Moroku a flower in place of the bouquet toss, a not-so-subtle hint that she should be the one to get married next. When she moves on to talk to her other guests, a very weepy man comes over to say hi, and immediately perks up when he realizes who Moroku is. 
But this blubbering idiot isn't the father of the bride, he's actually the father of Kyochi. Moroku is shocked to finally meet her future father-in-law, who apologizes for the late introduction and calls over his wife. Momiji Sano is the current head of the family, and boy does she act like it. When her husband starts causing a racket, she punches him straight in the gut and tells him to shut up. Clearly, Kyochi takes after his mother. Moroku is pretty nervous to be meeting both parents, but Momiji is very keen to get to know her future daughter-in-law better, and suggests they talk more at the home they never visit. Once they're at the Sano residence, the parents turn into completely different people, poking Moroku and asking her sweetly when she's finally going to become their daughter. It seems like Uda is the one responsible for Momiji's character shift, since they accidentally ate some chocolates which had alcohol in them, and now, well, let's just say Momiji is a serious lightweight. At least she's a little less intimidating this way. And now that she's a little more chatty, Momiji starts telling Moroku about Kyochi's childhood. Momiji took on Kataru's work rebuilding the clan reputation while also managing the family business, which meant that Kyochi spent more time with Uda and Saya than his parents since they were so busy. Kyochi is so embarrassed by his parents that he interrupts and beckons Moroku outside. She makes a comment about them being quite different from what she imagined, and Kyochi apologizes for their drunken behavior. When they get to chatting, he confirms his mother's story. He was alone a lot as a kid, but he himself never felt very lonely. His parents were there for all the important occasions, and when they weren't, he had Uda and Saya. So all in all, he feels very fortunate with the family he had. But there's still something more he wants. Can you guess? When Kyochi says he wants her, Moroku tells him to stop acting so entitled. And while Kyochi can be pretty arrogant at times, he's got a point. At what stage is this lady going to make up her mind and marry the poor kid? Kyochi's parents must be thinking the same. But when they come out to say goodbye, Momiji tells Moroku that they will support whatever decision she makes. Besides, Kyochi just fell for her. Legend or not, he doesn't really care about the whole contract thing. So, Momiji says she's just happy so long as they're enjoying each other's company. Once everyone is packed up and gone, Moroku practically throws herself at Kyochi, pulling him into a hug and getting very touchy-feely. She starts doting over him and talking about how wonderful his parents are, which seems pretty out of character, until Uda points out that someone has been at the liquor-filled chocolates again. Looks like Moroku is the affectionate type when she's drunk, but something tells me Kyochi doesn't mind that at all. In her tipsy state, Moroku climbs on top of Kyochi's lap, slumping against him and acting all cuddly. It's kinda cute, until she decides she's way too hot and says she's too drunk to take off her coat. Poor Kyochi is barely holding it together, trying to untie her coat like she asks, even though the bow is placed in a somewhat conspicuous location. Luckily, Moroku saves him from the awkward task by suddenly falling asleep, so he puts her to bed before she can cause drama. When she wakes up, Moroku can't remember much of the day before. When she wakes up, Moroku can't remember much of the day before, but the conversation with Momiji sticks in her head. From what his mother had said, she's figured out that Kyochi must have known her before their contract, but strangely, Moroku can't remember ever meeting him. Moroku is wondering about all of this when she suddenly trips down a staircase, heading straight for the ground. Then, out of nowhere, some kid in a hoodie appears, grabbing her just in time. When he puts her down, Moroku recognizes Kenchan's face, but it's actually Satoru the doppelganger. Understandably, she's a little suspicious about the kid who was literally trying to murder her a week ago, but Satoru reassures her. He's not going to hurt her, and he can't do much anyway, since he's under watch by one of Uda's snakes. Actually, he was only out because he's running an errand, looking for a girl called Emily on Mary's behalf. Once Moroku knows her friend needs help, she enlists everyone she knows. At school, Kyochi and Makoto start asking around for Emily too, though it's kinda hard since literally all they know about her is her name. To make things easier, Moroku has promised to bring Mary to the Sano house so they can get some more details on this girl they're looking for. This is all news to Satoru, who is planning to find her on his own, but he can't turn away their help, so he stays put at the Sano household waiting for the others to arrive. Satoru is a little surprised just to be allowed back in the house after Kyochi's speech last time, but Saya assures him that Kyochi isn't angry with him anymore, not after he saved Moroku from falling down the stairs. Because, apparently, that's all it takes to forgive someone who held a knife to your throat. Satoru is a little uncomfortable being stuck with the old couple, so he tries to rush out and hunt for Emily on his own. But as he runs towards the gate, Uda senses a presence coming and yells at him to stop in his tracks, just as a terrifying black force appears from behind, reaching a hand out towards Satoru. Uda grabs him out of harm's reach just in time and petrifies the stranger, at which point it turns out it was only Viola trying to play a trick on the kid. She's brought the others with her, including Moroku and Mary, who finally tells them the truth about this girl Emily they've been searching for. It turns out, Emily is the girl who created her. You see, some legends are born by word of mouth, breathing life into stories created by humans that never had any physical form. Others, like Mary and Makoto, had a kind of body that fused with an urban legend. Emily was a jealous doll maker who created Mary and kept her by her side. 
until the day when she moved away and left Mary behind in a box to be sent to the dump. Ever since then, she has wondered why someone who treasured her so much could have thrown her away. And so, she became an urban legend, always wandering in search of her maker. Recently, she felt a wisp of Emily's presence back in town, so she wants to see her maker one more time before she finally lets go and fades away. Moved by her story, Moroku promises to look for her. She forms a search party with her reluctant Satoru, leaving Viola and Uda behind to pass on the story to the boys when they get back from school. They don't have much luck until they find a playground, where Mary can feel Emily's presence close by. But she notices that Satoru seems a little angry, which he denies before wandering off to a vending machine, where he finds a young girl trying to reach a drink. Like a proper gentleman, Satoru grabs it for her, but when he sees the girl's face, he freaks out. Moroku runs over to find this little copy of Mary named Rosalie, who is actually Saruta's little sister. At just the same time, Makoto and Kyochi arrive, announcing that they found Emily. As it turns out, Emily is now an older lady. In fact, she's Saruta and Rosalie's aunt. When Makoto and Kyochi ask the fan club boys about her, Saruta heard the description and thought it sounded a lot like his aunt. She fits the exact description they were given, but she's got a bad leg, so she doesn't go outside much, which might explain why they couldn't find her. They're invited in, but Satoru suddenly gets moody and runs off, so Makoto goes after him. That leaves Kyochi and Moroku to walk through the house. While he wanders out back to the garden, she finds her old maker Emily watering the plants. Summoning all of her courage, Mary comes out from her hiding spot and introduces herself. The moment Emily hears her name, she jumps out of her wheelchair and gives her a hug. She apologizes for leaving her behind all those years ago and says it was all an accident. The reunion is touching. It seems like Emily has missed her just as much as Mary has. Meanwhile, Makoto has chased down Satoru, who is ranting about how stupid it is for Mary to spend time with the girl who threw her away, when she only has so much time left as a legend. It seems like Satoru actually found Emily a while ago, but he can't bear the idea of Mary fading because of a human, especially one who treated her so callously. While he's admitting all of this, his mentor suddenly appears in the phone booth behind him. She's proud of him for finally being honest, and sees it as a sign that he's slowly being reborn. Satoru is shocked to see Mary still alive. He thought she was going to turn back into a doll the moment she met Emily. But Mary says she has no plans of perishing, and that he's more important to her than Emily is right now. That in itself is pretty touching, but even better is the news that Moroku reveals. Since Satoru worked so hard trying to find Emily, he ended up spreading her rumor all across town, considerably extending her lifespan. So it looks like Mary's going to be sticking around after all. In class, the school festival is coming up, so Kenchon announces that there will be a class vote on what they want to spend it doing. Kyochi picks the sweet shop, since he's hoping to get Moroku along and she's most likely to go for that one. When he gets home, he finds his fiance waiting for him in a Halloween costume, her latest attempt to terrify him. As usual, it doesn't work, mostly because the costume is cute, not scary, but Moroku still demands trick or treat. But Kyochi picks trick which throws her for a loop, because she doesn't really have anything prepared. You'd think an urban legend would always be ready with some kind of terrifying trick, but Moroku really just wanted some sweets. And when she starts tearing up, Kyochi caves and tells her there are honeycomb toffees in the kitchen. Looks like her sweet tooth remains undefeated once again. The next day at school, the vote results in a tie between all the activities, so they decide to just combine all the options and host one big event with a little bit of everything. On the day of the festival, everyone gets involved. Even Saya and Uda show up. Moroku gets totally lost in less than five minutes, and while wandering by herself, she stumbles upon three little kids who are trying to find someone with crosses on their cheeks in Kyochi's class. Since she's heading that way anyway, she offers to take them along, even though she has no idea where her fiancé's classroom actually is. Lucky for her, Mike-chan is around, and spots Moroku and the kids sitting on a bench nearby. She calls Kyochi to let him know where they are before running off to attend her student council duties. Kyochi walks over to find Moroku chowing down on a giant ball of cotton candy. It's kind of adorable how much she's enjoying it, until he sees how much she paid and realizes that his fiancé has absolutely no self-discipline when it comes to sweets. She invites him to try some, but instead of going back to buy more like a normal person, he leans down and picks out a piece that got caught in her stitches. Obviously, that turns Moroku into a blushing mess, but now Kyochi is embarrassed too, and the two start bickering and play fighting while the boys watch on, calling them a lovey-dovey couple. I hope someone ends up teaching them that this is not what romance looks like. Kyochi asks who the kids are, and Moroku says they have an older brother in the same class, and are apparently looking for someone in the school who also has stitches in their mouth. It's kind of surprising to hear of another slipmouth person, but apparently this double is only appearing for the school festival, as part of the Chaos Cafe their class is hosting. 
And when they turn up, they immediately realize why. As part of their maid cafe routine, the class are putting their pupils in maid costumes and painting them up to look like Moroku. Poor Makoto took over another girl's shift, having no idea he would be put in this outfit. So now, he's standing there in the cosplay of his sister, humiliated, and only feels worse when the real Slipmouth woman turns up. The little boys turn out to be Kijiyama's brothers, and he thanks the couple for bringing them back. Meanwhile, Makoto is desperately apologizing to his sister for dressing up as her, trying to explain that it wasn't his choice. But Moroku thinks he's kind of adorable, which gives him the confidence boost he needs to start owning the maid costume. They're interrupted by a sudden screech from inside the makeshift cafe, where Uda and Seiya have been waiting for Moroku. It looks like their horror house themed maid cafe is going better than expected, and some of the costumes are so real they even freaked Uda out. Apparently, it was Kyochi's idea to have the maids dress up like the Slipmouth Woman, which comes as a surprise to absolutely no one. Moroku decides to take it in stride, assuming that means he must think she's a little scary on some level, but as usual, the only thing Moroku manages to frighten is his heart. Kyochi is soon put to work on their escape room quiz, and is proving very popular with the young ladies of the school. You have to get the quiz right, or else they won't let you leave, and make you listen to a scary story as punishment. Poor Uda has been there for hours at this point. Moroku is already a little spiky watching him talk to so many young girls, but when one in particular leans super close, she gets annoyed. So annoyed, in fact, that she walks over to them, jealous at the idea of Kyochi smiling for someone other than her. But when she gets close enough, she overhears the conversation, and realizes they're actually talking about how infatuated he is with Moroku, giving Kyochi a chance to throw her compliments left and right. He pulls her into the conversation, and the girls confirm that he talks about her all the time, and there are lots of stories about their life together. While Moroku and Kyochi are arguing about their romance being public knowledge, Makoto finishes his shift and goes off to change in the next classroom, wondering if it might finally be time to give up on trying to break their marriage apart. His sister seems happy, but then a voice in his ear tells him that he'll have his only family stolen again if they get married, and suddenly, he's not so sure. Kijiyama walks into the classroom, suddenly interrupting his dark moment alone. He says he's fine, but hearing that voice again has shaken him. He usually turns his supernatural hearing down while he's around humans, but that voice crept back in again, and made him wonder if his sister would choose Kyochi over him if it came down to it. He's pulled out of his thoughts by a classmate, who asks him for money from their class finances to go buy more snacks and drinks for the cafe. Kijiyama offers to get them, and asks Makoto to come with him, since the festival is several days long and they can bring them back tomorrow. Meanwhile, Moroku and Kyochi are walking home together, and she asks him if he was spreading her brother's story to the kids earlier. Kyochi admits he was, but only because it was the story assigned to him. Some other student must have submitted it. Both him and Moroku are surprised someone else knew Makoto's legend, because he's nowhere near as famous as his sister. Moroku wonders if he's trying to spread his legend himself, which isn't exactly common. Kyochi becomes curious, so he looks up the record to see who submitted it, and discovers it was actually Kijiyama, the same Kijiyama who's taking him out to a sketchy supermarket near the train tracks. Makoto complains that he hates the sound of trains, which is a little fishy since the train tracks are what his legend is based around. Getting suspicious, Makoto accuses Kijiyama of trying to get him alone. His classmate admits he was trying to take him out for a chat, but only because he noticed that he was feeling down earlier and wanted to check in and make sure he was okay. Surprised, Makoto says he's just a little tired, and Kijiyama tells him he can always come talk to him about anything. He's walking away, when a train suddenly rushes by them and Makoto freaks out, overwhelmed by the memories. Because it turns out, not only are the train tracks the site of his legend, they're also the place where he died. I guess it makes sense that Makoto was a human at one stage. After all, he is classified as a zombie, so he must have been alive at some point. In a flashback, it's revealed that the young Makoto was actually close to death. Ironic, since he ended up with supernatural hearing as a legend. Too weak and sickly to go to school, he was abandoned by his parents not long after his birth. Luckily, he made friends in the orphanage, especially with one boy in particular, Toku-chan, who would talk to him about the outside world. The two of them grew up together, Makoto still being pretty much housebound at 15, when his friend won an essay contest about who he wanted to become when he grew up. He asked Makoto what he wanted for his future, and he admitted that he wanted the impossible, to have a family. Toku-chan said that he already had one family member, and promised the two of them would always be together. It made him so happy at the time, but the day came eventually when they were split. Makoto had no idea. But one day, he discovered that his friend did actually have family, some relatives who decided to adopt him. Makoto was so upset that he shut his friend out, thinking he was really relieved not to have to be around him anymore, and calling him nothing but a stranger. He was still angry at Toku-chan until the day of his school ceremony came, and he discovered he had left his prize-winning essay in the orphanage. Makoto read the essay and realized it was all about him, about how proud he was to call him brother, and how he wanted to be by his side forever. 
Devastated, Makoto immediately regretted everything he'd said and ran out of the orphanage without his hearing aids, trying to reach his friend and deliver the essay. He was still very weak and couldn't hear much, and ended up tripping on the way, dropping pages of the essay all over the tracks. When his friend came running out to him, he saw him on the tracks and screamed to try to warn him, but it was already too late. He didn't hear the train or the screaming and died there on the tracks, cut up into pieces by the train. It was Moroku who found him and used her thread to stitch the pieces of him back together. And when he said he was looking for a family, she offered to become his sister. The only problem was that they couldn't find his head. So Makoto made his own one, styling it to resemble hers, just like real siblings. And that's how he came into being. He was remembering all of that in a dream. And when he comes to, he's at Kijiyama's house after collapsing by the tracks. He called Kiyochi when it happened, since he didn't have any family number and knew his sister was living with him. But he understands Makoto's reservations about their relationship. Anyone would after hearing him talk in his sleep. Apparently, he admitted just about everything, especially how he feels Kiyochi is stealing her from him. Kijiyama understands why he feels that way, but reminds Makoto that his sister won't stop being his family if she gets married. He suggests that he open up to her and tell her about everything he's feeling. He ends up staying for dinner and gets to see the chaos that is Kijiyama's family and his seven other siblings. Then the doorbell rings, and it's Moroku, not Kiyochi, who comes to pick him up. It looks like his sister cares for him far more than he realizes. Moroku thanks Kijiyama's family for looking after her brother and takes him back, promising to stay with him tonight instead of at the Sano household. Touched, Makoto wonders if now might finally be the time to tell her all the fears he's had about her marriage, but he's scared and freezes up. And as any good sister would do, Moroku tries to reassure and encourage him, and suddenly he comes out with it. He admits that he doesn't want her to get married, and wants desperately for her to come home with him instead. But he knows that Kiyochi is the one who makes her happy, only he could make her smile a certain way. So he's conflicted and scared at the idea of her going away. Maybe he's expecting her to be mad at him, because when Makoto hears his sister telling him what a good brother he is, caring so much about his family, he starts to cry. He can't understand why she's so kind to him, when all he's done is try to separate her from Kyochi and act selfishly. Moroku hugs him and tells him they can talk more about it later. First, she wants to get him home. As they start walking home, Makoto tells her he's really happy to be a part of her family, not realizing that he's walking past his old friend Toku-kun from his mortal life, who turns out to be Kijiyama's father. What a small world, huh? After their heart-to-heart -heart the other night, Moroku was left wondering what kind of smile her brother was talking about, the one that only Kyochi can bring out in her. She's trying out a few different ones by the pond, when the man himself appears behind her and practically gives her a heart attack. Yet again proof that Kyochi is far better at scaring than she is. Embarrassed at the idea that other people see her acting differently around her fiancé, Moroku decides not to smile whenever she's with Kyochi, a promise she immediately breaks when she remembers they're having waffles today. So much for that iron will. Immediately regretting her moment of weakness, she tries to act stoic, even when Kyochi comes in and whispers in her ear about how wonderful the waffles will be. And of course, she gives in. She's still struggling to keep a straight face while she's eating, which makes poor Seiya think she doesn't like the waffles she's prepared. When she gets all flustered, Kyochi hits the nail on the head, asking why she's trying so hard not to smile. Finally, she admits that it's because Makoto mentioned she has a different smile when she's around him, which obviously he's delighted to hear so she doubles down her efforts and swears never to smile again around him, even when he pulls out a load of ridiculous tricks to try to get her to crack. Weirdly, the thing that finally gets her is a screaming chicken, which makes her burst out laughing, finally allowing herself to be honest about the happiness he brings out in her. So it looks like these two are still all loved up in their own little world, but Moroku still hasn't decided if she'll marry him yet, and who knows what other obstacles will appear before these lovebirds say I do. This time, Moroku is back in the realm of legends, visiting her friend Viola, you might remember from last time, but Viola likes to get a little touchy-feely, and gives Moroku a big squeeze as soon as she sees her. Viola tells her hugs can relieve stress in humans, and suggests she try it on Kyochi, a good long hug, face to face, to help him with some of those teenage hormones. Moroku isn't convinced, but when she comes home, she finds her fiancé completely freaking out about his entrance exams and university applications. Seems like she couldn't wish for a more perfect opportunity, so Moroku offers him a hug. It's probably the most formal kind of physical affection anyone has ever seen. They even ask permission before they touch each other. But while she's hugging him, Moroku can feel Kyochi's heartbeat going crazy, and wonders if this is really helping him relax or just freaking him out even more. He starts opening up about his fears for their future. After all, his 18th birthday is just around the corner. That will mark exactly one year since Moroku arrived at the Sano house, and will also be the point at which they either agree to get married or walk away from one another. Moroku tries to discuss it with him, but Kyochi holds her close. 
Turns out, hugging his fiancée for this long has turned his face all red and he's too embarrassed to let go. Honestly, at this point, it's weirdly impressive that she hasn't realized this kid is completely in love with her. Still holding one another and blushing redder than tomatoes, Moroku gets up the courage to ask Kiyochi what exactly it is that he likes so much about her. Kiyochi says it was love at first sight, which, if you remember, was all the way back when he was a kid, just after his grandfather had passed away. He spent a lot of time alone, and was very cautious of getting close to people, worried about ending up hurt when eventually they leave him. So maybe it was destined that Moroku would turn up at that point in his life, and pull him out of all those dark feelings. While Kiyochi is having a really intense flashback, his poor fiancé is struggling to remember even meeting him at that age, and feels super embarrassed to admit she has no recollection of the moment he fell for her. Which is kind of fair. I mean, he was also a literal preschooler, it's not like he would have caught her eye. But what Moroku does remember is that it was about that time when her rumors started to die out, so she went around scaring as many people as she possibly could, including a lot of kids. She asks Kiyochi if she scared him back then, but of course he says no. Given his usual family history, he was already very used to seeing all sorts of urban legends at that point. He admits that as he grew older, he saw her face a few times after that, but only from afar, learning more about her each time. And even at that young age, he felt himself slowly falling in love with her, a feeling that hasn't changed to this day. Finally realizing the true extent of his feelings for her, Moroku is overwhelmed. She asks if he really understands what it means to be in love with a supernatural creature, if he truly realizes that they're not the same. Just as Kiyochi is trying to confess his feelings, Uda walks in and interrupts them, giving his fiancé an excuse to go off and find some housework to occupy herself with. As she's walking away, she tells Kiyochi that she doesn't feel the same, that she's never felt any of those romantic feelings he described, and never will. Ouch. Sounds a little harsh, don't you think? That night, Kiyochi is unable to sleep after their heavy conversation, and goes wandering around the Sano estate. He's so wrapped up in his thoughts that at first, he doesn't notice Moroku's corpse floating in the pond, her slit mouth torn at the edges, eyes staring blankly at the sky. Obviously, it's a pretty horrific sight to stumble upon, and Kiyochi immediately starts freaking out. He wonders if maybe she was closer to disappearing than he realized. Has she been wasting away right before his eyes? Was last night the final straw? As he's desperately trying to make sense of this gruesome scene, Moroku manages to moan a few words, telling him she's in pain and asking why he didn't save her sooner. That's when it clicks. Something isn't right, and not just with Moroku. Kyochi leans down to the woman in the pond, and asks them to stop whatever kind of act this is. He seems to think that this is some kind of doppelganger, even though it's not Satoru. It turns out he's right. As the horrific copycat rises from the water, they grab a hold of him and tell Kyochi that he's a cruel man, and deep down, he wants for Moroku to turn out like this. It sounds insane. He's completely in love with the Slipmouth woman. There's no reason to think that he would cause her any harm. But this illusion is getting in his head. And when the doppelganger corners Kiyochi, telling him he's in denial about the true nature of urban legends, it's kind of hard not to believe them. He pushes the strange creature away, but just as they're leaving, they warn him to not let things end up the same way they did in the past. And that's when he wakes up. Or at least, it seems like he wakes up. Kiyochi can't tell whether it was a dream or reality. Freaked out, he goes looking for his fiance, but finds Seiya instead. When he asks where Moroku is, she has no idea who he's talking about. Spooky. But this thing goes way bigger than Seiya. Kyochi rings up everyone he knows, and none of them have any memory of the supernatural bride-to-be. They don't even know her name. Even her belongings have disappeared from the house. After a full day of searching for Moroku to no avail, a defeated and exhausted Kyochi decides to head home and wait for Uda so that he can contact the other urban legends. It seems like Moroku's legend has finally died out, but surely that wouldn't be this sudden. She was at home with him just yesterday, and the Sano words are powerful. They should have been able to protect her, to keep her alive. The only other explanation is that the imitation he saw last night might have truly been her. And because of the Sano power of Kododama, when he told that shapeshifter to get out of his sight and never return, maybe it was powerful enough to banish her from all memory. Kyochi is relieved to find Satoru standing in front of the gates to his house, and even more relieved to discover that he remembers Moroku. He asks if any doppelgangers might have copied her recently, but Satoru says that's impossible. They can't copy other legends, only humans. They go inside to call Mary, hoping she might know where Moroku has disappeared to, but she's just as clueless as the rest of them. Then Satoru heads outside and grabs Moroku's spool of thread from the ground, tossing it to Kiyochi and telling him to give it back to her. The last thing he says to him is good luck, as dark hands rise from the ground and grab Kiyochi, dragging him through the pond. When Kiyochi wakes up, he's in some kind of underground cave, surrounded by rubble and rocks. Oh, and a giant creepy spider with like a hundred eyes, which is super convenient since Kyochi's one and only fear is bugs. It crawls towards him, asking him to give up his heart. It looks like it might be just about to attack or even eat him, but guess who turns up at just that moment? It's Moroku, 
Looks like he didn't accidentally erase her after all. The two of them escape the cave and start walking along an abandoned set of train tracks. Moroku starts trying to explain the crazy sequence of events that led them here, but Kyochi isn't interested. All he cares about is that she's okay. She admits that she vanished of her own accord, but rather than getting angry at her, Kyochi apologizes, admitting that he didn't understand what it means to be an urban legend. When she first arrived, he secretly hoped that her story would continue to fade, so that she would have no choice but to marry him for survival. He thought he was doing it because he loved her, but now he knows that the toy with her fate was wrong. When a human dies, they leave behind plenty of things once they're gone, but urban legends completely disappear. The idea of losing her smiles, her laughter, every memory they had together, it finally made him realize what's at stake if Moroku's legend begins to fade away. Kyochi apologizes for being so selfish, but Moroku cuts him off. Ever since they lived together, she's hated herself for being different from him, for not being human and not having a heart that can love like his does. But Kyuchi says she does have a heart, a really beautiful one. That's why he fell for her. After all those mushy romantic confessions, Moroku kind of just brushes him off and changes the topic to her disappearance. Apparently, she asked for everyone to pretend she had vanished in a grand attempt to finally scare Kyochi. And technically, she did succeed. The poor guy was terrified. But she doesn't feel good about it. So instead of ending their contract with her win, she proposes an alternative, suggesting they extend their contract until the day his heart stops beating. And then, she proposes. Finally, after all this time, it seems Moroku has given in to her feelings and decided to stay by Kyochi's side until the end of his life. It's equal parts romantic and creepy. Seems only fitting for a couple like this. Moroku promises to try and scare him every day, making him so happy that it terrifies him for as long as he lives. And it looks like she's already got a head start. Kyochi is so shocked that he seems terrified already. In fact, he's so surprised that he thinks he might be dreaming. So to convince him this is reality, Moroku leans up and kisses him. And after a smooth move like that, how could he possibly say anything other than yes? All their legend friends are overjoyed and start showering them with congratulations. Although some of them are less than happy to have witnessed the kiss, particularly Makoto. When he walks over to congratulate them, he apologizes for scaring Kyochi. But since it was all just one big prank to help Moroku propose, I guess it's okay. Although, Uda points out that it could really happen one day, so it's more of a drill than a prank. Either way, Kyochi applauds them for such a convincing performance. He mentions the urban legend who pretended to be Moroku's corpse floating in the pond, but she says that had nothing to do with her. Now, everyone is freaked out, and people start speculating that it might have been some kind of ghost. But since things turned out alright in the end, they let it go. As they turn to head back home, no one notices the two figures watching them from across the river, including the fake Moroku. The shapeshifter, whose name is Shin, takes off her mask to reveal her true nature, a creepy young woman in traditional clothes, not unlike the Slipmouth woman. The other legend, a kind of sea creature, warns her not to mess around with the Sano family, and tells her to be more careful next time. Whatever that means. Oblivious to the two legends clearly plotting against them, the others return to something like daily life after the proposal. Well, everyone except Kyochi, who has come down with a cold. Moroku and Uda get to talking, and wonder if that pond he fell into has more of a sinister connection to the legend than they first realized. It would make sense. After all, I can't even count the number of times they've fallen into it. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something fishy going on. Moroku mentions that she's often thought she's heard someone calling her from beneath the pond, someone who doesn't want her in the Sano house. Uda starts to wonder if that fake Kyochi mentioned might be some kind of water phantom. They leave Kyochi to recover in his room. But when he wakes up, it's not the cold that's bothering him. He's still reeling from his first ever kiss with Moroku, and wondering if he made a fool of himself. Then, out of nowhere, his past self shows up. The past Kyochi ridicules him, and tells him to act more manly and start taking the initiative if he doesn't want Moroku to fall out of love with him. As if that wasn't enough, a way younger Kyochi appears, and says it's not such a bad idea to let Moroku take the lead for once. It seems like poor Kyochi might have finally lost it. And I mean, who could blame him? A kiss and a proposal at the same time would send any high schooler reeling. When Kyochi wakes up, he finds Moroku at his bedside, offering him some soup for breakfast. He asks if he can have a kiss instead, which goes down about as well as you'd expect. There's an awkward silence for a second before Moroku gives him a gentle little peck and runs off. Eventually, Kyochi recovers from his cold and ends up in an argument with Uda about his marriage. He agreed with his mother long ago that he would only get married at 18, but Kyochi wants it sooner. It's only when Uda convinces him that the dating period is only precious before their wedding that he gives in. Through all their conversations, Moroku is watching her fiancé, surprised to find that he seems to be sparkling these days, even when doing the stupidest little things. She's so surprised that she even asks Uda to lift up his hair, but he isn't sparkling. So the only explanation is that love has changed everything, even the way she sees. Isn't that just adorable? Everything he does is cute to her now, so she starts poking and prodding at him. 
Catching her hand, Kyochi grabs and pins her to the floor. But for once, neither of them shy away. In fact, Kyochi finally works up the courage to kiss her himself. But that doesn't get rid of the sparkle either. Nothing will erase it. It looks like Moroku is locked in for life at this rate. A few days later, Moroku's lightweight limitations strike again, when she mistakes a bottle of sake for water and drinks the entire thing. She passes out and has to be carried to bed by Uda, while Kiyochi asks Seiya if all legends get drunk so easily, since he's never seen Uda drink. But it turns out, that may not be the case. Uh-oh, it's flashback time. Years and years ago, when Seiya was still a young woman, her and Uda celebrated their one-year anniversary with a big meal and a very big bottle of sake. At the time, Seiya wasn't sure if Uda really drank at all, since they'd never shared a drink together, but after just a sip, her husband was giggling and leaning all over the table. Seiya tried to keep her cool, but he got all handsy and cute, wiping things from her lips and tackling her to the floor. He went on a long, soppy speech about how happy he was after only a year of marriage, before passing out on the floor. When she asked Kotaro, the leader of the Sano family at the time, he revealed that Uda had never got so wasted when they went drinking, which made her wonder if he was pretending to be drunk so that he could act more flirty. I wouldn't put it past him. After that fond memory, Seiya tells Kyochi that alcohol tolerance varies according to each individual legend, so it's more than possible that Moroku is really just a lightweight after all. The next day, Kyochi begins to take all the proper steps to be with Moroku, starting by asking her brother for her hand in marriage. But to his surprise, Makoto seems hesitant. I guess it shouldn't come as such a shock, since he worked so hard to break them up in the first place, but the younger legend admits he's not against the marriage. He wants his sister to be happy, and he knows Kyochi can do that, but something in him really doesn't like the idea of giving in after all this time. To get around this hesitation, Makoto suggests the two of them bond to earn his approval, by going on a kind of brotherly date together. Sounds kinda sus, but whatever you say. They take Moroku with them to make it slightly less awkward, and head to an aquarium, because according to Makoto, that's the best spot for a date. Kyochi points out that amusement parks are way better, but Moroku seems to be having such a good time that neither of them really care. She walks around pointing out all the different fish they've eaten in the last week, while her brother and future husband mess around teasing each other. Eventually, she calls them over to a jellyfish tank, which finally stops them bickering, even though Moroku is such a glutton that she wants to try and eat them too. They go for sushi afterwards, and Kyochi watches the siblings talking and catching up, happy just to see them enjoying themselves. Because they're literally at a sushi restaurant, it looks a little weird when Kyochi shows up with a bowl of ramen, which gets Makoto so mad that a server has to come over and tell them off for being too loud. Well, I guess that's one way of bonding. After they're done eating, Kyochi acts like a proper gentleman and goes up to the counter to pay for them, while Moroku finds a load of cute little sea creature toys that she wants to get her hands on. She tries to call Makoto over, but he tells her to go on ahead. There's something he wants to discuss with Kyochi. Alone. Well, that sounds incredibly sinister. But even more concerning is the fact that we haven't heard any more from that shapeshifter and her fishy ally. While Moroku walks home alone, her brother and fiancé are having one final face-off before they become in-laws. And what arena do they choose for their final showdown? Fishing. Because that seems like the perfect way to settle their year-long animosity. Apparently, it was Makoto's idea, since he lost so badly after their last competition where they played badminton for like three days straight. But he has more than one reason for taking Kyochi to the fishing ponds. There is an old legend that says you can usually find supernaturals on the surface of the water, so he was hoping that by sticking near water, they might be able to get some information about the latest legend out to terrorize Kyochi and Moroku. In fact, that's the reason they went to the aquarium beforehand. Makoto has been trying to pick spots that will give them a better shot at finding the shapeshifter. But Kyochi says he isn't interested in hunting them down. He has a feeling they'll turn up again anyway, whether he goes looking for them or not. The conversation turns to the impending marriage, when Makoto finally gives his blessing to their union, although he does say that he'll take his sister back the moment Kyochi dies. Nice one, Makoto. Way to spoil the mood. Despite that gloomy caveat, Kyochi isn't bothered, and even says he intends to become an urban legend when he dies so that he can stay with Moroku. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work that way, but even Makoto is a little freaked out, because I guess if anyone could do it, it'd be Kyochi. Over the next few days, Moroku and Kyochi are in heaven, finally enjoying their chance to live together as a couple. But their premarital bliss is cut short when Momiji turns up, announcing that she wants to divorce Kyochi's father. Great! I'm sure that's just what two fiancés want to hear in the run-up to their own wedding. To soften the blow, she's brought a ton of specialty items from a bento shop, and sits down with her future daughter-in-law to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. She congratulates Moroku on her official engagement, before explaining that she and her husband got into a fight, and a pretty serious one at that. In the heat of the moment, Momiji ran away, which she used to do when she was younger. 
Her mother was very sick and died when she was in middle school, and her father was always incredibly busy keeping up the Sano name and working. Her father has always been absent and unsympathetic with his daughter, so they rubbed each other the wrong way a lot. They fell out especially badly when her father decided to throw away her mother's old things. She tried to hide them, but turned up to find a pair of clumsy burglars attempting to steal it all. But instead of stopping them or calling for help like a normal kid, Momiji asked them to kidnap her. Well, I guess now we know where Kiyoshi gets his flair for the dramatic from. The burglars went along with her plan, and were surprisingly nice to Momiji, even buying her drinks and snacks. In getting herself kidnapped, she managed to save her mom's things from being thrown out, but she needed a plan to take them off the burglars' hands. While rummaging through the antiques, an old legend named Amabiko emerged from a nearby river. As future head of the Sano family, Momiji was already well acquainted with Amabiko. In fact, he had been caring for her ever since she was little. So he was concerned when he saw her getting kidnapped, and came to check in on her. He didn't say much, and ran away before the burglars could spot him. But seeing an old friend made Momiji realize she had made a mistake. She asked the burglars to take her home, but instead, they tried to take advantage of her. Luckily, before things could get too dark, a cop showed up and beat those punks to a pulp. He yelled at Momiji and told her that her father was worried sick, which was news to her. She didn't think he would really care whether she was at home or running away. That's why she was always staying out so late and running off to the police station. It was just because she wanted him to notice. The kindly policeman who was her savior realized all of this and stayed with her until backup arrived. I'll give you three guesses who the policeman turned out to be. Eventually, her father arrived with the rest of the officers, but instead of scolding her, he broke down in tears and apologized. All his feelings came rushing out, how sorry he was about not visiting her mother and for leaving her all lonely by herself after she died. Seeing him so vulnerable, Momiji realized that the man behind the workaholic used to be a cheerful and emotional person, but somewhere along the way, she forgot about that side of her father. She apologized for running away, and the two of them reunited. And after all that, it turned out the stuff the burglars were trying to steal wasn't even her mother's. It all belonged to the previous head of the Sano family, which is why her father was giving it away. Before the police cleared out, Momiji ran up to the officer, whose name was Hajime, and thanked him for saving her, and from there, the rest was history. After retelling the story to Moroku, Momiji seemed sad. Her husband seemed so cool to her back then, but now she just finds him a nuisance to handle. Moroku encourages her to try and work things out once more. After all, Kyochi would be devastated if his parents split up. Momiji realizes she's right and agrees, joking that if she keeps running away after every fight, Hajime will probably fall out of love with her. And right on cue, the man himself shows up, yelling that he could never fall out of love with her. He apologizes for yelling and becomes a blubbering mess but this time, Momiji isn't embarrassed by him. She apologizes as well, and the two of them are immediately lovey-dovey again. The argument quickly forgotten. When everyone is back home, Uda jokes that Kyochi and Moroku will one day turn out just like them, but Moroku doesn't think her future husband is much like either of his parents. Maybe she doesn't see the resemblance, but I'm sure Kyochi will turn out just like his mother when he's older. Later, we find out that Satoru is finally ready to become a legend of his own again, and this time, he's using all the intelligence he gained from his doppelganger days to become an all-knowing urban legend. Just one phone call will allow him to spill human secrets. It seems like a pretty good legend, and one that is appropriate for the kid about to take over Mary's position. But it does keep him busy. Satoru is hanging out with Makoto, Kiyochi, and Kijiyama's siblings when he gets a call asking for directions from someone who claims to be lost. It's kinda creepy, and the tension ramps up even more when Viola appears in her half-mangled state to freak out all those poor kids. After traumatizing them for life, Viola admits she actually just came to give Kyochi their wedding present. They get to talking about Satoru's new legend, and how he had to keep something of his original self in the story so that he didn't lose his old identity completely. It's another reminder of the differences between humans and legends, which leads Viola to ask if Kyochi wants kids with Moroku someday. It's a pretty weird question to ask a kid who's not even 18 yet, but she's not just trying to tease him. After all, it is a fair question. Who knows if a human in an urban legend could even have a child? Kyochi asks if she's bringing that up as some kind of warning, but Viola says that's not her style. It is, however, the style of the shape-shifting legend, who emerges from Viola's wedding present, floating out to meet Kyochi with a creepy smile. Something tells me this isn't going to end well. When Moroku gets home, she finds Kyochi passed out on the floor, with a mask on his face, and shells scattered all over the house. She tries to pull the mask off, but Uda tells her that it'll peel his skin along with it. The mask keeps someone trapped inside an illusion, sending them to sleep, but it also sucks the life out of him. If Kyochi has the mask on too long, he might die. In fact, Uda isn't even sure he'll make it through the night. 
Obviously, Moroku completely freaks out. But luckily, Uda recognizes this as the handiwork of Shin, the shape-shifting legend who appeared as Moroku to Kyochi before she proposed. Uda explains that she's a kind of mirage, one of the more ancient supernaturals who married into the Sano family a long time ago. He hasn't heard from her in decades, so he has no idea what she's doing meddling in their family affairs now. Uda unpetrifies Viola, who he turned to stone the minute after they found Kyochi. Moroku is upset that her friend was clearly involved in this attack, but all she cares about right now is saving her husband. Viola says she just needs to satisfy Shin by playing Kayawase, a game where you have to match different shells. Moroku grabs one of the shells lying about on the floor, which are actually illusions of common items from around the house. She needs to search the shells to find a mask that matches the one Kyochi is wearing. When she's done that, the game will be over and hopefully Shin will be satisfied. It sounds like an incredibly messed up way to toy with her fiancé's life. When Moroku asks how Viola could just do this to her, she promises that she cares about her friend very much, just not about Kyochi. As you'd expect, that makes Moroku really angry. She freezes the pond and makes it form shards of ice. It looks like she might even be about to hurt Viola when Makoto storms in with Satoru, promising to help her search for the mask. They leave Satoru to guard Viola, so the rest of them go off to search the house. But there's an unexpected surprise awaiting Uda in one of the rooms, where he finds Seiya and Kotaro from the days of their youth caught in a compromising position. He shuts the door, but every time he opens it, there's a new scene of the two of them together to torture them. Looks like Shin didn't want to play fair, so she decided to leave behind some more powerful illusions to make the game even harder. The last one is the stone petrified image of young Seiya, which is the final straw for Uda. He walks away, at which point Shin appears as an illusion of Kotaro, asking how he can stay so calm at the sight of his wife turned to stone. Shin wonders if it doesn't bother him because he would never turn a human to stone, but Uda says he's not that kind. The only reason he wasn't phased by her illusions is because he trusts his old friends implicitly. He knows neither Kotaro or Seiya would ever have done anything to hurt him, so there was no way the illusions could be real. While he's telling her this, Uda manages to wrap Shin up in a giant black serpent, and just as he's got her cornered, she finally takes off her mask. And while those two have been having an epic, legendary showdown in the other room, Makoto has been struggling to find the mask inside the wreck Shin has made of the Sano house. Something about the rubble and water takes him back to his childhood, and even though he tries to stay focused, it is easy for him to be swayed when an illusion of his old friend Tokokun shows up. Damn guys, I know it's easy to get distracted, but can we focus up? At this rate, Kyochi is going to be gone by sunrise. The illusion is so strong that the ringing in his ears comes back, along with all the emotion he felt on that terrible day when he died. He tries to convince himself that the boy standing in front of him is only a fake, but the young Toko-kun seems real enough. He tells Makoto not to search so hard, that he should take a break and come play with him. And then he grows up before his eyes, clutching his chest and begging Makoto not to leave him behind. But Shin underestimated how much anger Makoto still had for his old friend. They got into a fight, and eventually Makoto breaks down, feeling like his old human self in front of Toko-kun who was once his brother and his only friend. Seeing him look like a human again and crying makes the illusion of Toko give in. He tells Makoto to go after what he was searching for and take care of himself, but before he leaves, Makoto asks the illusion if he can bring him along too. Toku agrees, but the moment the two boys hug, he disappears. Poor guy, that's one heck of an illusion. Uda and Makoto reconvene. But since neither of them found the mask, that eliminates every area except the one Moroku went to search, so all that remains is whatever illusion is waiting for Moroku. When she arrives at the shed, Moroku finds it empty except for an old painting of a woman, who looks a lot like her, with the torn slit where the mouth should be. Shin herself appears suddenly, explaining that it's not Moroku in the painting, even though they have the same face. Apparently, the woman in that painting was a monster who toyed with the lives of humans and legends alike, including Shin. Moroku is cold in her introductions, but Shin reveals that they have met before. In fact, Shin is actually her godparent. It seems like there's a lot more history between these two than anyone realizes, but Moroku doesn't care. She cuts her off and asks where she can find the mask, threatening to wring the answer out of her. Throughout this whole mess, Moroku hasn't been able to find out Shin's motive for all this madness, but going all the way back through the Sano family history, she did arrive at one possible answer, that Shin was actually married to the last evil head of the Sano family, the one that Kyochi's grandfather ousted when he turned the legends against him. Moroku suspects that Shin really loved her husband, and is taking out her anger on Kyochi now that another legend is trying to marry into the family again. But Shin squashes that theory instantly. But since she worked so hard to try and understand her opponent, Shin agrees to give her a hint. It turns out, Moroku's legend was actually born from that painting, 
When humans saw it, they came up with lots of wild theories to explain who that woman was and who ripped the painting. And out of all those rumors, Moroku emerged. So the incredibly cryptic clue she gives her is that the shell she's looking for can be found in her own origins, somehow connected to that painting. Which is very frustrating and unhelpful, of course. But Moroku is determined to save Kyochi, so she takes Shin's hand and agrees to learn about the woman whose face she wears. But when Shin pulls her close, she reveals that this isn't any form of revenge against some long dead enemy, because the truth is that she loved that woman, so much so that she gave Moroku the same name to honor her. So she sends Moroku into an illusion to find the mask and learn the truth about her namesake. Almost as soon as she wakes up, she is greeted by a young woman, who calls her Madam, and says she came to their home to become the new head of the Sano family. She introduces herself as Kome, Moroku's older sister, and hurries her straight to the Sano house. While she's trying not to raise too much suspicion, Moroku is also trying to figure out where the mask is because the clock is still ticking. Inside, the girls bump into Katsuru Sano, the future clan leader, who looks significantly less evil than Moroku was expecting, given his reputation of marrying and imprisoning urban legends. From what he says, Moroku deduces that the real Moroku was looking for someone, a very specific urban legend which may or may not have existed. But before things can get even more mysterious and complicated, she runs off to find a quiet place where she can get her thoughts together and figure out what the heck is going on. Alone in Moroku's room, she decides to search for the mask, but instead finds the girl's diary. From the diary, Moroku discovers that her namesake was cursed with the power of Kotodama. It was so strong that she could bring fortune or ill will to anyone with the power of her words. But that made people afraid of her, and so she grew up very lonely. That's how she got recruited into the Sano family. At the time, they wanted to maintain the Kotodama in their bloodline, and so when Moroku was discovered, she was adopted into the family. She gained two new sisters, Komei and Ryo, both older than her and both very kind and loving siblings. Moroku was treated well by the Sano family, and learned a lot under their care. One day, she found an urban legend lying by the riverbank, on the brink of death. Moroku used her power to revive them, and brought the legend known as Waratsumi no Mizuchi home. He lived with them for some time, and Moroku grew attached, but in the end, her older sister Ryu revealed the ugly truth, that Mizuchi couldn't stand to be around Moroku. When they found him that day by the river, he had been trying to die. So when Moroku willed him back to life, he wasn't exactly grateful. Overhearing the damage she'd caused, and also discovering Ryu's jealousy over her stealing her rightful position as the head of the family, Moroku told her sister that she hated her and Mizuchi, and that she wanted them both to disappear. Of course, with the power of the Kotodama, her wish came true, and she lost them both forever. From that day on, Moroku decided to wear a mask so that she could hide her emotions and keep her lips tightly drawn, never allowing her powers to hurt anyone again. Well, it's one heck of a backstory, but does that mean that the human Moroku is herself the mask? And what does this mean for Kyochi? Is there any way for our lovers to be reunited? Find out in the next episode. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more recap content.